Welcome to Peninsula Beat. I'm Maria Soreo. Fire officials are warning residents that Southern California could be facing its worst fire season in over 100 years. Many cities and states throughout the Southwest are on high fire danger alert, and fire officials are preparing for a potentially historic fire season. L.A. County Fire Department Captain Andy Alvera reminds residents the importance of brush clearance, as well as other ways you can be prepared during fire season. We want to talk about the brush fires because, as we said before, you know, fire season is pretty much all year long here in Southern California. Absolutely, especially here on the backside of the hill, uh, which has a lot of what we call one hour fuels. And what it means is in, in one hour with night, uh, a dry day with some heat, it could dry it all the way out and be ready for fire. Oh. So it, it really does it. We truly don't get out of fire season, especially over here. Obviously, from the very beginning, we suggest that you adhere to your brush clearance uh, recommendations and rules. Uh, we come around once a year. I hate doing it. I hate going to people's backyard to tell them what they have to do to clean their yards. But to, to be honest, it's a help me help you situation. Absolutely. It gives us what we call defensible space. Okay. Uh, what it does is it enables us to get in there and uh, prevent the fire from consuming your home. Okay. So it's it's invaluable when, it, when it's needed. It's like an insurance policy. We hope we never have to use it, but when we do, we want it to be a good one and your in your clearance and adhering to what we're requesting is is the good policy fire officials say that 94% of fires are started by people which means 94% of fires can be prevented and residents came out in record numbers to celebrate our nation's birthday it's an annual event that is sponsored by the city of Rancho Palos Verdes and we were there for all the fun We are here today at the city of Rancho Palos Verdes, a 4th of July celebration. Now, Caitlin, we know 4th of July means lots of good food. Fireworks. Lots of fun. Flags. That's right. And it's also the city's 40th anniversary. So let's go out and have some fun. Let's do it. Now, what is your favorite part of Fourth of July season? Oh, um, to me, it's uh, being an American and knowing and re and how hard people fought, declaring our independence, and everything we did beyond 1776 to keep fighting and fighting to make sure that we would preserve our freedom. To me, it's acknowledging um, all those who fought to preserve our freedom and those who continue and things that we can do to continue to preserve our individual freedom and protect our nation at the same time. Now, not only is Susan going to be very busy today because you are going to be running some games and participating. Yeah. Susan, tell us about that. Well, I'm just learning about it, Maria. Uh, it's sort of on the fly. The okay. city manager comes up to us and she says, you're doing this and you're doing this. And so then between the council members, we have to negotiate who's willing to do what. So I am willing to be the mummy wrap person. So for any detractors out there, you might enjoy watching me get wrapped up and mummified. <laughs> But um, I'm, anyway, that's part of it. Okay. But I'm really looking forward to the hula hoop contest because I will be participating in that. This is the 40th anniversary booth that has lots of interesting uh, facts about Rancho Palos Verdes. So we'll start with the first table. Tell us what's on the table. Okay, this table and most of the exhibits here are to do with the uh, incorporation of the city of Rancho Palos Verdes as the fourth city in the Palos Verdes Peninsula. And just a bit about the early, um, the founding and a little bit about the um, the farming um, the farmers and as well the early uh, city council members and there's a picture of them right there well there's nothing like good old country music to celebrate the 4th of July or really any holiday here in Rancho Palos Verdes right behind me Boomer McLennan is getting ready to play <laughs> This year's celebration also featured some new games from the Frozen T-shirt competition to a hula hoop contest. And as you can see, it was quite a hit with everyone who attended the celebration. 
The Cancer Support Community held their annual event at the Botanic Gardens. Celebrate Wellness raises funds to help families who have been touched by cancer. Here's more. Celebrate Wellness is a food and wine tasting event that took place at the South Coast Botanic Garden. The event was held to raise money for the Cancer Support Community, Redondo Beach. This year was the 17th annual fundraising event which included celebrities from NBC's The Biggest Loser and The Hangover Part 3. Guests of this event got to enjoy strolling through the scenic garden and listening to music as they sampled delectable cuisines from some of the area's finest restaurants. They got to taste exquisite wines and bid on fabulous treasures in the silent and live auctions. Cancer Support Community Redondo Beach provides over 150 free programs per month of emotional support, education, and hope for people with cancer and their loved ones. Services include ongoing drop-in networking groups, informational brochures, weekly support group programs, kids support community, stress reduction and mind-body activities, educational lectures, and workshops on nutrition and treatment. For more information, you can go to cancersupportredondobeach.org. And when we come back, there's a new voice coming from the Norris Theater, and one local deputy is recognized for his heroic efforts. We'll be right back. Caution, you have entered the Peninsula Extreme Fire Danger Zone. Prepare for an emergency before disaster strikes. Clear all brush and weeds 35 to 200 feet around your house. Make sure to have 10 feet of clearance around the chimney and do not store firewood or flammable materials next to your house. Remove all dead trees. Dry and dead trees will explode in a fire and send sparks quite a distance. Top and prune trees as a precaution, especially near utility lines. Do not plant trees on slopes. Instead, use ground cover or hillside to help hold the ground from eroding and keep fires from progressing. If trees are not topped and pruned, they become heavy during the rainy season and will pull down the tree and roots, causing mudslides. Trees not mended on a hillside in a fire with winds will feed the fire. Install sprinklers around your house. It's your home. Be safe and protect it. Keep debris such as pine needles and leaves cleaned off your roof and out of your gutters. Remember, the peninsula is an extreme fire danger zone. Use these tips and keep your family safe during the fire season. Visit our city website or come to the Emergency Preparedness Committee meetings and learn how you and your family can get prepared for an emergency. Brushing for two minutes now can save your child from severe tooth pain later. Two minutes, twice a day. They have the time. Hi, I'm Deputy Chris Knox, here to remind you of the importance of traffic safety near our schools. School zones are always 25 miles per hour. A school zone only applies when students are outside the school in the morning and the afternoon. Parents should always allow extra time when dropping off their children and should know the school's drop-off routes and procedures. Motorists should also focus on safe driving near schools. Some of the violations I see near schools are cell phones, speeding, double parking, seat belts, and child safety seats. Students should always remember to cross safely at intersections and not to run out in front of cars. When we follow these rules, we can all stay safe. Deputy Chris Knox is being hailed a hero by an elderly couple in Rancho Palos Verdes, and the city of Rancho Palos Verdes gave him a very special award. He had um, uh, received a call that there was an elderly couple that hadn't been heard from in a couple of days. He gets out to the scene, does a perimeter check, walks around, and he can hear 
sounds inside the home suggesting that you know, they were in there but they just couldn't get to the door. Uh, with the assistance of the fire department, uh, he was able to make entry into the home. We found the elderly couple um, on the floor. He was able to get immediate aid to them and uh, you know, they're doing, doing fine now. But uh, that's uh, you know, Deputy Knox. He comes to work every day and the community gets a uh, good bang for their buck with him. <laughs> but Deputy Knox is a hero, and I'll tell you, he's a, he's a hero every day by what he does. You know, he is a, a, a household name on the peninsula yeah. through his traffic enforcement, and I think you know many folks, parents particularly, uh, point to him as uh, you know potentially uh, having a uh, um, an impact, a positive impact on their children, and particularly their their driving habits. Right, and as we said at the council meeting, I actually took a couple minutes before he was honored to talk to Deputy Knox, and here's what he had to say about the fact that he was recognized. It happened a few weeks ago, uh, an older couple had both fallen down inside their house on Valen Drive, and they couldn't get up. Uh, the lady from Meals on Wheels called us, and uh, because they hadn't picked up their food for two days, she was worried about them. She and I went up to the front door, we could hear them talking but they were not really responsive and uh, we were concerned about their safety. So I uh, checked my supervisor and I called the fire department and they forced entry into the house and we found the two uh, victims. They were taken to the hospital and they're gonna be okay. That's good to know they're okay. This also though brings to light the fact for all of us to be aware of what's happening in our neighborhoods, especially with elderly residents. What is the um, sort of the lessons learned from this situation for you that you like to share? Uh, the sheriff department recommends that you keep an eye on your neighbors, particularly the uh, elderly. And if you trust your neighbors, exchange keys. And tonight being honored, I'm sure you're, you will enjoy that. Anything you want to let the community know about just this special recognition? Uh, that's just it. Keep an, <laughs> keep an eye on your neighbors. So, Captain, how long has Deputy Knox been here serving in our community? Uh, well over 20 years in this community, and he's just reached his 30-year milestone as a member of the L.A. County Sheriff's Department. And the Norris Theater has welcomed in a new member to their family. Robin Franco is the new managing director at the Norris. I had a chance to sit down with this local resident who talks about her very interesting journey that brought her to the Norris. I started out as a software engineer and my first job was for Magnavox which was located in Torrance right by the courthouse. Very close. And I developed navigation systems for ships. So I would spend about three months a year traveling all over the world. I used to say they sent us to the armpits of the world <laughs> where we would install these navigation systems on board. And I was typically the only woman on board the ships and I worked with their technical crew. So they, they really did protect me and they kept me away from the ship's crew many of whom were out at sea for six months at a time and haven't seen a female in, in months. So it was okay, but it was a great job and I learned a lot. After that, how did that bring you to the creative arts? When I left the job, okay. my engineering profession, um, it was at a time in my life where I really the whole world was open to me. And I thought, you know, what do I really wanna do with my life? And I decided at that point, I wanted to do something that filled my heart uh, and I wasn't so much worried about the pocketbook side. Okay. So at that point, I really transitioned into the nonprofit world. And I took my very first job as the director of the Jewish Federation in the South Bay. Wow. And that was a brand new adventure for me where I really was passionate about the work that the Federation did. I talked to a lot of people about it, gave presentations. I had gone to Israel a couple of times. And it was, it was just wonderful work. After two years at the Federation, I decided that I, I wanted something where I, w where I had actually more contact with the people, with okay. like a congregation or my constituents. And I became the executive director for Temple Menorah in Redondo Beach. And that was wonderful and I did that for the last seven years. And then as luck would have it, somebody sent me an email, this is the God's honest truth, that had the job posting for the Norris. It wasn't like I was looking for another job. And I read it and I thought, oh my God, that is my next job. And so I applied for it and it was a really long uh, process. There were many, many interviews. Yeah. And I, I believe they started out with 60 applicants and they narrowed it down to 10 and then they narrowed it down to four and then they narrowed it down to two. And so literally this was a three month process. And at no time did I know or was I given the uh, sense that I was gonna be the one. 
you know, really interesting because you would think they would bring somebody in that would have a theater background, but yet you had the passion, obviously, and the wherewithal to be the selection. That's amazing. I think that they had used theater people in the ba in the past, yeah. but sometimes it's, it's a it's good and it's a it's a mixed blessing. Right. Um, because you have people who are very familiar with the arts, but they might not have the business, exactly. the strength in the business area. And so I think this time they really wanted to find somebody who had a strong business sense, but that also brought passion to what they do. Yeah. And um, I just feel really lucky to have been that person. Well, obviously you're very special to have been selected. Um, did you ever see a production here uh, growing up or in the past years? Absolutely. So first of all, when my kids were really young, they had a whole family series and many of us would come together with our kids. And then I'm not sure at what point in time that changed or maybe it was the case that our kids just grew up. And so we kind of outgrew it. But then years later, when my kids were in high school, um, my daughters, well, at least my oldest daughter was they, all my kids went to Peninsula. Okay. My oldest daughter was on the dance team, and every year they had their recitals here. So I, I was here, worked in the green room, um, backstage, helping the kids with their quick costume changes, and also sat out there as a uh, as a guest watching the show. So what is it like for you now being on the other side, even though you've been in the back before, when you kind of just look around this amazing theater and know that you are a part of it? Well, it's really exciting, for one thing. Um, I'm learning a lot. I certainly didn't know like the technical name for everything that's around us here. I, I really didn't have an appreciation for what's involved in terms of the lighting crew and the sound crew and all of the work that goes behind the scenes in building a set and the costuming and the makeup design. I mean, there's so much that's involved. I'm learning about it now. Mm -hmm. And so that's kind of fun for me to be in a place where every day there's something new. And on a sad note, one of the founders of the Norris Theater, Joan Moe, has passed away. It was Joan's dream to create a theater where everyone in the community could come out and enjoy the magic of live theater. And she did just that. Everyone in our community came out to honor this very special lady. Well, she loved the community, and she loved the hill, and she loved the Schweitzer, and she loved help the homeless, but her true love was the Norris Theater. That was her baby, that was her idea. Uh, her and Agnes Moss came up with this and 30 years ago, probably 40 years ago, I think there was 10 years in planning, and they, they put it together, and it was unbelievable, unbelievable. You know, we, we interview a lot of the actors that come through the Norris, and the one thing that you see is the love and the passion that people coming in have for this theater. <laughs> she must have had the same kind of passion. Talk about that. Yes, it's probably one of the most comfortable theaters to play in. I mean, you're right there with the audience. You can hear the audience breathe. You can hear them laugh, giggle, whatever you're doing, even cry a little. And uh, that's what makes it just so fantastic because it just adds to the actor and it just keeps him alive and going and fresh. Yes, she started out as a chorus girl. And in fact, she and my wife were a chorus girls and kissed me Kate probably 25 years ago. But then she was so dynamic and so sparkling that she eventually worked into the female leads and we played probably six or seven shows where we were the love interest and uh, that's how I really got to know uh, Joan and really enjoyed it. What was it like for younger people who came into the theater? Um, what was it like for them to meet somebody like her? I think they were all just a little bit in awe because she's so down to earth. I mean, she's such a strikingly beautiful woman with that, I'll never forget in Hello Dolly, my two little grandkids were here. They were both five and six years old, my granddaughters. And when she came down the stairs in that red dress and that blonde hair, my, sit, my daughter said they got on the edge of their seat and their eyes turned into pancakes. They just loved it. And she won them over and a week later, they meet, they meet Joan and we're in, up in the center and they, I say, Joan, I'd like you to meet my two granddaughters. Hello, Dolly, they said. Now let me fast forward to about a, a year ago. My granddaughters are now 24, 25. We're up at the mall, there's Joan, and I forgot about the incident. And I said to Joan, I said, Joan, I'd like you to meet my granddaughters. Both of them said, hello, Dolly. Aww. Yeah, I mean, that. she just that kind of gal. Joan may have only weighed 125 pounds, but she was an absolute power of strength. 
and she was so personable and she just brought joy to everyone. She, she was a, a very positive person and um, with a, a can-do attitude. Uh, no matter what she set out to do, if she made the decision that she was going to do it, there was nothing that could deter her. She was as strong as steel or iron. She was just such a power of strength and she would pursue and persevere until she reached her goal. God love her. I will always think of Joan as the great lady of the peninsula. There is, there is no par. She was par excellence and we will miss her terribly. And in sports, we take you to Trump National Golf Club to the second annual Albert Pujols Charity Fundraiser. Now, the Pujols Family Foundation supports families who have children with Down syndrome, as well as the impoverished families in the Dominican Republic. Now, I had a chance to sit down with Albert at Angel Stadium, who talks about his lifelong friendship with Mr. Donald Trump. Then I caught up with Mr. Donald Trump himself, who's always happy to have Albert and many superstar athletes come to Trump National to raise money for their charities. Uh, I know Mr. Trump for a long, long time. I play many, many of his courses and you know, uh, every time I go to New York, I, I pay a visitor to his office out there uh, you know, in downtown. But uh, you know, just a great gentleman and you know, it's just good to uh, get to know him and just he usually give me advice you know, over the past year or two. And, he wish I would have gone to New York and played, but uh, <laughs> you know, but uh, just a great, great man. What was your impressions last year of the golf course out at Trump National? I know he's very proud of it, and of course the views are spectacular. Beautiful. Uh, we have, first of all, oh, God bless us with the great weather. So the, we the weather was beautiful. We we had a great time. It was just uh, everybody keep talking about the golf course. Man, I want to come next year. You know, just uh, make sure you send me the invitation. I mean. And, uh, you know, I, I want to thank him, and I thank him already, you know, for just opening his door, and uh, he's like, oh, sure, whatever you need, that's why he told me, just, uh, you know, just have one of the girls, you know, take care of the whole thing, so uh, I was really uh, exciting. I mean, I knew the course was going to be in pretty good shape because I play in Florida, and uh, the one that he has in Florida, and uh, it's just, the maintenance is just great, you know, they always keep the, the courses in, in great shape. You had a pretty great group of people, of course, golfing last year, and this all for your charity, for your family foundation, to help families with Down syndrome. Talk about that. Um, you know, it's uh, this is one of our biggest events that we do to, during the year. Uh, we got this, uh, the, our golf tournament, and at the end of the season, we do like a whole night divine, and pretty much those are the biggest uh, fundraise, you know, to raise money for our Pools Family Foundation. And uh, actually, as you know, uh, you know, we take ma mission trip to down to the Dominican Republic. We, we do a lot of activity with uh, kids with Down syndrome, and obviously, uh, you know, being our second year here, we're going to be more involved with those kids. I know we have an event uh, coming on next month for the kids with Down syndrome here in Orange County. So, uh, just to give back, you know, I, I think it's more than again. I mean, I, and I'm able to take that uh, these blessings that God has given me, uh, you know, to to rich people and just to to bless them the same way that God has given me. And uh, Donald Trump has taken a. a a fine liking to Albert, and um, they get along well. They've been, you know, played golf together before, and um, Albert really enjoys his company, you know. And so I think, um, it, what a sweetheart, like what a sweet guy, you know. And I knew that when Albert, uh, when we pulled the golf tournament out here, that, uh, you know, Donald would make sure that Albert was well hosted and, yes. and taken care of. So he has definitely come through. He, he's a really sweet man, and um, it's it is a beautiful golf course. So many golf tournaments have been here. Um, last year, for the very first time, Albert Pujols had his yes. tournament here. I had a chance um, to talk to him at great length, and he said that he had known you for a very long time. That's true. And when he moved here from St. Louis, he said, I knew I was going to have my tournament right here with Mr. Trump. We yes. have many of the great athletes, yeah. they have tournaments, That's and you know, right. they're all wealthy people, frankly, and they've done very well, and they're great people in many cases, not in all cases, but in many cases, and Albert's an example, and they have their tournaments here, and they raise a lot of money for charity. And we have, I mean, literally 
I would say, 50 or 60 of the great athletes having their tournaments. And whether it's the Lakers or the Clippers or the Kings or anybody, I mean, the Dodgers, the Dodgers and the Angels, yeah, right. uh, they're always at Trump National and they love, you know, they love what's going on. And finally, how would you like to take a trip back in time when all you needed to do to get around was just jump on a trolley? That's right, the Port of Los Angeles is offering nostalgic rides on a rebuilt red car trolley. And Jean Clayton has more. I'm standing here in San Pedro at the Red Car Railroad Station. This is a classic train dating back many, many years, and it's a real tourist attraction here in San Pedro. So come with me as we find out more about the history of the classic red car. Okay, you're standing in front of car 500, which is a replica of a Pacific Electric 500 back in the 1920s, 1930s. It's one of two of the replicas we have running, 500 and 501. 501 right now is actually out on the tracks. We're now in our maintenance facility with 500. Originally, LA was uh, a network of uh, red cars and everything. These cars, are they a replica of that? Yeah, these are precise replicas. What we had, we had examples of the old cars out at the uh, Orange Empire Railway Museum in Paris, California. They have real, re the real cars out there. And we were able to send our maintenance people and our, our constructors out to look at the cars and replicate them exactly. So when you get on this car, you're actually getting on a car that would be in the 1920s. When you were rebuilding them, did you have any sort of set of rules, as it were, for the people that actually did the building? Well, what we had is uh, we had people who worked at the port. The craftsmen at the port were actually finished carpenters. And if you get on the cars, you'll see a magnificent woodwork. And all that woodwork was done by our carpenters, including the, the boot at the end was all steam bent wood. All the woodwork inside is all mahogany. The seats are all ash. And we had one person whose only job was to go to the lumber yard and pick out the lumber and match it all. <laughs> what about the people who run this, the driver and the conductor? Was it hard or challenged to find the right sort of person? Well, they're, that's your contractor. That's Herzog Transit Services. They're a, a division of Herzog Company. And they, they do this ar around the country. They have another line up in California. This is kind of, I call it their toy department here, but they have, <laughs> they have con commuter lines in, in Texas and California. There, we have two people on the car. And it could be more economical to run just a driver, which, uh, like if you go to New Orleans, there's just a driver on the car. I wanted a conductor on there also to interact with the passengers, as you saw today. That's what they do, is to hand out the conductor caps and greet people on the car to make it more not just a transit line, but to make it a real tourist line. Okay, so if you're wondering what to do in San Pedro for a dollar, come on down here to San Pedro. You'll see the days and times and opening times on your screen right now. Okay, this is John Clayton saying, thanks for watching. I'll see you next time on Armchair Traveler. That John Clayton really gets around. And that will do it for us. From everyone here at RPV TV, make it a great day.